Hey guys, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you for going ahead and getting this done. Now, I know a little, some of you guys are a little mad at me. Um, you guys would prefer to not have a lecture after an SAQ writing exam. I um, mean, I understand that, but we have a lot of stuff we have to get through. And the good news is, is today's lecture is pretty awesome, all right? The Mongols are pretty much the most interesting pastoralists in history. And I'm gonna cut through all of the talking uh, in the beginning, and I'm gonna get you guys right into a short video and um, the lecture. Okay, so I'm gonna try to make this as short as possible. Again, as usual, guys, make sure you are writing down these notes, okay? Um, the Mongols, again, are probably one of the most important societies that we talk about in AP world history, okay? Now, I'm not asking you to do a G Persia chart today, but it will, you will see my PowerPoint kind of follow that structure a little bit. So, let's begin. Okay, guys. Um, Again, now that we're, we're at the Mongols, guys, so we're pretty much almost done with period one. All right, we talked a lot about the societies of the world in period one. We still have to get through Europe, and we'll talk briefly about the Americas. But after today, we have both unit one and unit two pretty much done. So you guys are ready for your test next week, okay? I know that does not make you happy, but you're going to do it. All right, so today we're covering 2.2 and we are also covering 2.5. Okay, so let's begin. I wanted to start, guys, with this fantastic quote. So this guy right the, here is Genghis Khan, okay? He is, well, I'm sure many of you have heard of Genghis Khan before, or you've heard his uh, name in um, his native language, Temujin, okay? So Genghis Khan said, in the space of seven years, I have succeeded in accomplishing a great work and uniting the whole world in one empire. All right, and he's completely right. All right, Genghis Khan is going to be a brutal, horrific, terrifying, yet fascinating and interesting character. But we're gonna talk a lot about him today and we're gonna talk about the empire he and his descendants created, okay? So you don't have to write this down, guys. And this is just kind of your um, fun fact of the day. So many of you know about Genghis Khan as um, his prolific ability to breed. Okay, so while Genghis Khan was conquering huge swaths of Europe and Asia, he was also doing really terrible things, okay? Um, civilizations that did not immediately surrender to the Mongols were pillaged and destroyed and women were raped and it was an awful, awful period, okay? Um, so much so that today, one in 200 men in the entire world are direct relatives of Genghis Khan, okay? So there is actually a 0.5 chance that you are related to this guy, all right? So think about what that means. Think about how many people were affected by this crazy, brutal, um, yeah, crazy, brutal man, okay? There's also an 8% chance that you're related to him if you are Asian, okay? So I would assume that of my 160 students, we have some people that might actually be related to Genghis Khan, which is just crazy. I mean, I might be, I don't know. Um, that is how widespread this Mongolian um, ruler was, okay? And again, you don't have to write this, but I think it's really interesting to know, okay? Now, during this time, during this time that Genghis Khan and the Mongols were conquering huge swaths of Eurasia, it is estimated that over 400 million people are killed. That's a, an exorbitant amount of people, all right? At this point in, in the history, there's not even really that many people, all right? We have 7 billion people today in the world, but in between 1200 and 1450, they don't really have that population. So the fact that 40 million people are killed by Genghis Khan and the Mongols is just, it's mind blowing, okay? Well, I need you guys to understand that uh, the Mongol empire is indeed the largest empire in history. So it's bigger than Alexander the Great's empire, the Roman empire, um, Greek empire, even the British empire, okay? Make sure you guys understand that what we're talking about today, this is, this is an empire that is not for cowards, 
All right. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a five minute video. It's going to give you an overview of the Mongols. Now, I know some of you are going to want to skip through this. Don't. All right. It's a really good video and it gives you kind of that background information you really need about um, Genghis Khan, Temujin and the Mongols and how widespread this reach really is. OK, please watch this video. You don't have to take notes. I've got all the stuff for you afterwards. It was the largest contiguous land empire in history, stretching from Korea to Ukraine and from Siberia to southern China, and was forged on the open plains. In the 12th century CE, before the Mongol Empire formed, the East Asian steppe was home to scattered groups of Mongol and Turkic pastoral nomads led by Khans. The people herded sheep, cattle, yaks, and camels. They lived in felt tents and moved between summer and winter campsites. Nomadic women held significant authority, managing these migrations, many of the flocks, and trade. Meanwhile, men specialized in mounted warfare. These nomadic groups often fought each other. That was to change under Temujin, who was born into an aristocratic Mongol family. Despite losing his father at an early age and growing up in poverty, he quickly rose to power by forging strategic alliances with other leaders. Unlike those Khans, Temujin promoted soldiers based on merit and distributed spoils evenly among them. His most brilliant move was to scatter the nomads he conquered among his own soldiers so they couldn't join together against him. These innovations made him unstoppable, and by 1206, he had united the people of the felt wall tents and become Chinggis Khan. The Mongols were shamanists, believing that the spirits of nature and their ancestors inhabited the world around them. Over all arched the sky god Tengiri. Chinggis Khan believed that Tengiri wanted him to conquer the entire world in his name. With the nomads of the Mongolian plain united, this seemed within reach. Anyone who resisted the Mongols was resisting Tengiri's will, and for this insubordination had to die. Under Chinggis Khan, the Mongols first subdued northern China and the eastern Islamic lands. After his death in 1227, the divine mandate passed to his family, or the Golden Lineage. In the 1230s, Chinggis Khan's sons and daughters conquered the Turks of Central Asia and the Russian princes, then destroyed two European armies in 1241. In the 1250s, the Mongols seized Islamic territory as far as Baghdad, while in the east, their grasp reached southern China by 1279. Life within the Mongol Empire wasn't just war, pillage, and destruction. Once the Mongols conquered a territory, they left its internal politics alone and used local administrators to govern for them. The Mongols let all religions flourish, as long as the leaders prayed for them. Although they routinely captured artisans, scholars, and engineers, they appreciated what those specialists could do and forcibly settled them across Asia to continue their work. The most valuable produce in the empire was gold brocade, which took silk from China, gold from Tibet, and weavers from Baghdad. Gold brocade clothed the Mongol rulers, covered their horses, and lined their tents. The Mongols particularly prized gunpowder technicians from China. With much of Eurasia politically unified, trade flourished along the Silk Road, helped by an extensive system of horse messengers and relay posts. Robust trade continued at sea, especially in blue and white porcelain, which combined white pottery from Mongol China with blue dye from Mongol Iran. But this was not to last. Succession to the Great Khan didn't automatically go to the eldest son, but rather allowed brothers, uncles, and cousins to vie for leadership with senior widows acting as regents for their sons. By the 1260s, Chinggis Khan's grandsons were in a full-blown civil war over inheritance and fragmented the realm into four separate empires. In China, Kublai Khan's Yuan Dynasty is remembered as a golden age of science and culture. In Iran, the Ilkhanate inaugurated the development of new monumental architecture and Persian miniature painting. In Central Asia, 
The Chagatai Khanate brought forth leaders like Timur and his descendant Babur, who founded the Mughal Empire in India. And in Eastern Europe, the Golden Horde ruled for years, until a trading post named Muscovy grew into a major world power. Even though the empire lasted only a short while, the Mongols left a legacy of world domination that remains unmatched today. Trace the rise and fall of other powerful empires with this playlist. Okay, guys. So I hope that video was interesting for you. Um, I really liked it. I thought for a five minute video by Ted Ed, it did a great job at really summarizing the extent of the Mongol empire, okay? So as I said, you didn't have to take notes from that video, but again, everything that I have written down for you on this PowerPoint, you need to be writing down, okay? You need to be memorizing this. This is stuff that will be on your test next week, okay? So as we talked about in last class, guys, remember my little dangerous foreshadowing. We talked about how period one is this relative time of peace, all right? Between 1200 and 1450, most of the societies and civilizations we talked about were peaceful, okay? The Song Dynasty, East Africa, West Africa, um, South Asia, okay? All of these societies, for the most part, they had problems, um, but they were peaceful, okay? This is gonna change, all right? Period one is gonna get tossed on its head. So, and it's all gonna happen by this dude right here, Genghis Khan, okay? So, again, guys, we have nomadic pastoralists, all right? These are people that um, kind of live in the fringes between various empires, okay? Some of them are going to be the Mongols. So these people are not going to be members of any one civilization. Um, they're going to help facilitate trade or they're going to be kind of raiders of Silk Road trading. And what's going to happen is that the Mongols are actually going to kind of, um, you know, form these groups behind Genghis Khan. Okay, so they're small little settlements and they're going to slowly get conquered and they're going to form this giant army which is led by Genghis Khan, okay? And Genghis Khan is going to lead these Mongols um, on horseback and all throughout Eurasia, okay? They are gonna destroy empires. So all those peaceful empires that we talked about, gone, all right? The Song Dynasty is gonna get thrown out, the Abbasid Caliphate, bye, and many, many, many more are going to be taken out and absorbed by the Mongols, okay? Now, how are they gonna do this? Well, um, their style of warfare is gonna be extremely effective. So what uh, Genghis Khan is gonna do is that um, while he conquers other groups of nomadic pastoralists, he's going to absorb them into various different armies, okay? So they're not really gonna be able to rebel against him um, because he's gonna break up friend groups, he's gonna break up small civilizations, and they're gonna do so on horseback. So. Again, they'll be on horses, and this is going to provide them with a tactical advantage. Okay, so they are not nomadic pastoralists, so not only are they going to ride horses, but they're going to use horses for a lot of important stuff, right? So they're going to use horses for meat, they're going to get a lot of their food via horses, and they're going to fight all their wars on horseback, okay? They're going to develop a fighting tactic um, using swords as well as bow and arrows, while sitting on top of horses. It's gonna be extraordinarily effective. So they're gonna destroy tons of cities. So remember when we talked on a Monday, or I'm sorry, Tuesday or Wednesday about cities that were created on the Silk Road to help facilitate trade? Well, if those cities did not surrender to the Mongols, boom, they're gonna get destroyed. Okay, so the Mongols are raiders, they're pillagers and they're plunders. And while they are conquering civilizations and empires, okay, they're gonna do really awful things. So as I said, guys, think about all those people today that are actually related to Genghis Khan. Well, part of that is because these, these Mongols are gonna come into cities and they're gonna rape women, they're gonna murder men, um, they're gonna pull children away from their mothers. 
make them serve in armies. Okay. They're going to move people all around this empire as a way to kind of kill off this uh, loyalty to the former civilization. Okay. It's going to be a very brutal time, very brutal time. However, after the initial raping and pillaging and murdering, there's going to be a long era of peace. And we are going to talk about that in just a second. Okay, guys, I know I've got a lot of pictures of like angry Mongols on horseback, but I think they actually do a good job at showing just uh, the kind of fighting style you're going to see. Okay, so again, guys, the Mongols are going to terrorize Eurasia. All right, and this is going to be during the 13th century, so 1200 to 1300. All right, they're going to terrorize Eurasia, as in Europe, Central Asia, East Asia, okay, the Middle East as well. And they are going to build the world's largest land-based empire, okay. So, um, as you guys know, I really like my GIFs, my GIFs, whatever you call them. And I think this is a good one to show just how quickly Genghis Khan is going to conquer all of this land. Okay. All right. And we will talk a little bit more about this shortly. But what's going to happen is that after Genghis Khan passes on, he's going to break up this, this, this large empire into four different domains, as you can see from right now. Okay. You will see this. We'll talk about this do these different conates um, in just a minute. But you need to understand that this empire is the world's largest. Okay, again, it's larger than anything Alexander came up with, anything that we've seen before this point. Okay. And it's still growing. Look at that, guys. Well, now it's starting to decline a little bit. All right, so... Um, Hopefully you guys got a sense of how quickly Genghis Khan is going to rule um, make sure to go and download my PowerPoint to actually get this GIF just to see how quickly this, um, this empire is going to explode. All right. So guys, um, the political situation of the Mongols. So here's the deal. The Mongols are nomadic pastoralists, right? So before before they, they start conquering this giant empire, they're not really going to have a, a set government, okay? There's not really going to be an emperor. It's not really going to be taxpayers or anything. Um, again, there's not any cities that these pastoralists live in. So they're not really used to complex systems of government. So what's going to happen, guys, is as they come in and they start conquering smaller civilizations in Eurasia, they're actually just going to adopt the existing governments, all right? Um, they're going to get rid of the emperors, but they're going to keep the structures that were already there. So they'll keep the bureaucracy in China. Um, they'll keep, you know, the smaller government systems of the Islamic states. Okay. They'll continue the caste system in South Asia. Remember, and as I've said to you guys, the most successful empires are going to be the tolerant ones. By tolerant, I mean they're going to keep let people keep their languages, keep their religions, and keep their forms of government. So that's what you're going to see here. Okay, Genghis Khan's going to conquer this huge swath of land, but then he's going to let people rule themselves. Okay, as long as he's instilled one of his sons in power first, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So what's going to happen, guys, is one way to keep these local governments loyal is that the Mongols are going to move bureaucrats from one region to another to help them rule. So if you're a bureaucrat in the Song Dynasty of China, you might be moved to this, um, you know, another area, maybe in the Islamic states or um, in northern Africa. And this is going to help kind of solidify loyalty to the Mongols. Okay. And again, the successful empires are ones that are tolerant. So the Mongols are going to let these conquered groups keep their self rule, keep their self governments, um, as long as they remain peaceful. Okay. If anyone wants to break out in rebellion against the Mongols, which is just kind of stupid, um, since we know how awful and rapey and pillagey and how terrible they are, um, 
they're not going to be able to keep their government. Okay. But if they remain peaceful, the Mongols will let them keep their form of government. Okay. Now, ironically, guys, is that this is going to usher in 200 years of peace. Okay. So period one, okay. 1200 to 1450, the Mongols are going to take down a lot of those empires and um, civilizations. So between like 1250 and 1450, you're going to have this relative peace in the world. And that's why when we talk about period one, we're talking about societies that are just, you know, in, in general, peaceful and not really up in engaging in significant wars amongst each other. And this is going to be known as the Pax Mongolica. All right. I, uh, I spelled it wrong on this um, slideshow. Just make sure it's Mongolica, guys. So um, again, if you survived all that initial um, Mongol movement, all that raping and pillaging and whole horrific times under Genghis Khan, ironically, the next 200 years are going to be very peaceful for you, peaceful for your society. Okay. All right, guys, so economics. So we've talked a lot about the Silk Road in this class. We've talked about how important it is for land-based empires like the Song Dynasty, um, South Asia, the Islamic States, okay? Well, guess what, guys? Under the Mongols, we're gonna have a golden era of the Silk Road trade. Now, as I talked about, guys, um, empires, empires really, really need trade and they're gonna make trade safer and cheaper. And the Mongols are no different. Okay, the Mongols are going to make a lot of money off of this Silk Road. And so what they're going to do is they're going to make it safe. Okay, initially, the Mongols, before they conquered the world, and they're these nomadic pastoralists who are kind of raiding and pillaging trade. But now that the Mongols are in, in charge, all right, and they're realizing that they can make money off this trade, they're going to keep it safe. Okay. So what you're going to see is that under the Mongols, the Silk Road becomes a very important and very critical trading route. Okay. It's going to be very safe. So you're going to see the Silk Road coming all the way from Europe, all the way to China. Okay. Passing through this area of Central Asia. All right, guys, so the Mongols are also going to adopt the Chinese paper currency. So as we talked about in this class, currency is really important, right? It standardizes who can buy things and how much things cost. So instead of someone from North Africa trying to barter stuff for stuff from China, if you all use a standard paper currency, it's going to be a lot easier. So again, when you have one large world empire and you standardize currency, it's going to be very good for trade. Okay. All right. So religion guys. So here's, what's kind of interesting about the Mongols. Um, Genghis Khan did have his, his own sort of um, naturalistic religion. However, in general, what you need to know about the Mongols is that they were assimilators and not diffusers. What that means is that as the Mongols come into certain regions that practice um, Islam or Judaism or Christianity, they're actually going to adopt the local religion rather than force their, their previous religion upon the people. So as I said, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine after all the like raping and pillaging that the Mongols did, but the Mongols were actually very tolerant, okay? They believed that all people in the kingdom practiced a very similar religion, okay? They believed that um, Muslims believed in this, a similar God that Christians believed in, okay? And so they didn't really care what people practiced, um, but they tended to adopt what was local in that area. Okay, so you're going to see um, while the Silk Road has become safer and you're going to see a lot more cultures start to spread underneath the um, relative peace of the Pax Mongolica, you're going to see more missionaries. Okay, you're going to see people spreading world religions. Now, we talked about these world religions, guys, Buddhism, Christianity and Islam are world religions. Okay, so you're going to see missionaries begin to spread these religions all over the world. Okay. And again, 
the Mongols are going to adopt the religion of the area they conquer. And we'll talk about that in just a second. All right, guys. So building on our lesson from about the Silk Road, as well as the Indian Ocean trading route, you guys need to understand that um, because of the openness of trade, ideas, knowledge, and technology is going to spread everywhere. Okay, so again, the Silk Road becomes safer. Um, Maritime-based trading is, is occurring, and all of this stuff is going to spread ideas, knowledge, and technology. Okay, so again, kind of building on what we talked about already, you're going to see innovations from China or innovations from um, the Islamic states or East Africa. All of that stuff is going to spread and become part of other cultures. So you're going to see paper from China, printing, the compass, the astrolabe, gunpowder, Arabic numerals, banking, checking, and even Arabic. All of this is going to continue to spread, okay? What we talked about on Tuesday or Wednesday, um, seeds are going to spread, religion's going to spread, ideas will spread, innovation. The Mongols are going to make this easier because all of a sudden this huge swath of land is now um, part of one empire. Okay. And I know this is crazy because we started with talking about how cruel and brutal the Mongols were. But over time, they become a much more um, tolerant and open um, society. All right. They start to protect trade. And when you protect trade, you get ideas spreading. But ideas and innovations are not the only thing that spread, guys. So we talked about this a little bit already. Um, but one of the most important things you need to know about period one is this right here, the Black Plague, which I know feels a little ironic considering we are living in a global pandemic right now. But the Black Plague is surprisingly worse. Okay, so what's going to happen is the Black Plague is actually going to start in Central Asia. Okay, so it's 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 a, like bacteria that um, comes from mice. But what's going to happen is that you know we're we're dealing with all of these spreads of ideas and culture, right? The Mongols, as they're moving across Asia, they're going to bring the Black Plague into Europe. Okay. They're pretty much the primary reason that the Black Plague is going to spread so quickly. And what you need to know, and we'll talk about next week, is that one third of Europe is going to die from this plague. Okay, it's a brutal, disgusting, awful disease. And a third of Europe is going to die, which is just mind blowing. Okay. Now, I know there's a lot of words on this, and I know you'll probably have to slow, turn me off. Um, and slow me down so you can take these notes. But you have to know this about the Mongols, okay? So again, between 1200 and 1300, you get the initial giant Mongol empire, all right? But Genghis Khan's not gonna be able to live forever. So what's gonna happen is that they're gonna split the Mongol empire into four separate Khanates, okay? So Genghis Khan, Khanate, okay? So you need to know all four of these Khanates, all right? All of these Mongol empires are going to form and roughly uh, rule parts of Asia and Europe between 1300 and 1400, okay? They're all gonna have the traits of an empire, all right? So you know what the traits of an empire are. We talked about that on our second day of class. Okay, I don't have to go into that. The first one you need to know, and probably the most important one, is the Yuan Dynasty, okay? Or the Yuan Mongol Khanate, okay? The Yuan Dynasty is gonna replace the Song Dynasty in China, okay? It's gonna, as we said, the Mongols are assimilationists. So the Yuan Dynasty is gonna adopt a lot of Chinese practices. So it's gonna adopt Taoism, Confucianism, okay? It's also gonna adopt Buddhism, Okay, you're going to see um, one of, one of the, the most famous rulers of the Yuan dynasty is a man named Kublai Khan. All right, and Kublai Khan actually hires Marco Polo 
to be um, a foreign bureaucrat. So it's kind of weird to think of a European working for um, the major Khan of this Yuan dynasty, okay? So again, they're gonna adopt lots of Chinese practices. It's gonna be very important in what we now know as China, okay? Another Khanate is the Il Khanate, all right? It's a Mongol Khanate in the Middle East, okay? So ruling Mongols here are going to adopt Islam. Now remember, Mongols are assimilationists, so they're going to adopt the religion of the local people. So the Mongols will indeed rule parts of the Middle East, okay? The third one you need to know is the Golden Horde, which is probably the coolest name ever and it would be a great name for a team. Um, the Mo this is a Mongol Khanate in what is now known as Russia, okay? Um, these mo Muslim Mongols are going to rule over white Christian Russians, okay? The fourth Khanate is the Chigadi Khanate. It's gonna be a Mongol Khanate in Central Asia. All right, they too are going to convert to Islam because people are, um, they're, the people that they rule over are Muslims. And the capital is gonna be Samarkand, which is also a pretty cool name. So again, guys, all four of these Khanates are kind of just regions of what used to be the, the larger Mongol empire, okay? So let me just show you a quick picture of what this looks like. So again, guys, you're gonna have, this is what used to be the, the larger Mongol empire. After Genghis Khan dies, he's gonna leave his kind of favored sons in charge of these certain areas. Um, what you need to know is that um, all four of them are going to continue Mongol policies of spreading trade. Okay, so they're gonna protect the Silk Road. They're gonna encourage um, the use of a standard Chinese currency. And they're gonna, you know, make money off of this trade. They're gonna, you know, really encourage innovation that helps trade. Okay, but because of how much the Mongols are assimilationists, eventually this is gonna this is gonna hurt them. Okay, the Mongols are gonna try really hard to be tolerant of people, but eventually these empires are gonna collapse because of assimilation because they become almost too assimilated to these local populations. And we will talk about this when we get to period two, okay? So again, guys, this is what our um, broken up Mongol empire is gonna look like, okay? All right, so I told you I was gonna get through this quick. This is one of our most important days, guys, and I really, really hope that you paid attention, took good notes. Um, we have one more lesson, um, which we'll talk about Europe as well as South America. All right, and then we will be completed with period one. So again, period one, 1200 to 1450. And one of the major themes obviously is trade, um, also the Mongol empire. And so all of the stuff that I have talked about with you guys from day one of our class is gonna be on your multiple choice exam next week, okay? Um, so make sure you are taking good notes, um, still working on your review guide and asking questions if you have any, because we're coming up to our first exam on period one. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I love the Mongols and I will see you guys next week.